Has anyone heard of Backup Studios? You guys have? Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, I have some fun stickers. <laughs> uh, here's like, I don't know. These are our apps. Uh, you might have seen some of them, you might have not. It depends if you have an iPhone or an iPad. Um, we're also, uh, we have three apps on the Droid, and then we also have uh, a bunch on the Mac App Store. But they're basically like giant iPhone apps that you play on your Mac, so it's not really much different. Um, yeah, we're, we're based in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, we started in 2009, April of 2009. And it was just four people. It was just a really small shop, and I started, I was number four. Um, the three founders, they didn't come from video games originally. Um, one of them was a higher level executive guy at Yahoo, and the other two worked at a company with him as well. And they just were like, well, let's, let's start a company now. I mean, the economy was down at the time, so it's actually kind of a good time to start a company. Yeah, it just went from there. As soon as I got on, we made Paper Toss, which was like a really big hit for the time, back when apps were more simple. And uh, now we're up to 25-ish people in the office and uh, another 15 freelancers offsite. And uh, to date, we've had over 120 million installs of our game, so pretty well. Um, and today I'm going to show you how we did the characters in the game Army of Darkness Defense. Uh, has anyone heard of Army of Darkness? Yes. Cool, cool. Yeah, it is based off the, the franchise. Um, and we worked at MGM and uh, very slightly with Bruce Campbell, just mainly to approve his imagery. Um, but yeah, it was a really fun project to work on. And it has a whole bunch of characters and a whole bunch of animation, which is you know, on screen at once, a problem for the iPhone. So we came up with this sort of different way to deal with the characters. Um, I have a PowerPoint to kind of help you keep on track, because uh, I tend to diverge quite a bit. Let's see. Uh, all right. That's me. So, like I was saying, um, there's restrictions. Um, <clears throat> And then I'm going to go over some of the solutions and then the specific solutions that we use in Army of Darkness. And uh, that brings us to like the 2D3 rig, which is going to take up most of the, the time. Um, and then I just want to talk about before we got going really heavy on that stuff, 2D art versus 3D art um, in mobile games. Like 3D art I found to be more popular. You generally get like a much better response from the views and like people see it as like a higher budget game. Even if it's not full 3D, if it's rendered in 3D and you have like 3D lighting, people are like, oh my gosh, it's so awesome. Uh, so that's kind of the style that we've been going with. Although we do dabble with the, the flat sort of 2D kind of drawing style as well and that gets a pretty good response too. But um, generally uh, there's a lot of advantages to, uh, to doing 3D. Also, it's great for promo art, so if you want to make a character that is going to be animated on screen, he's going to be really tiny, maybe you render him out so he's really small, but then for promo art, you can have like big images. Um, you can put them on the icon, you can put them in ads. So if you guys ever um, get into uh, a situation where you have that sort of control, I would advise going the 3D route because it's, it proves really flexible later and you can do a lot of stuff with it. So what's so special about the characters? Uh, well, mainly just the restrictions. They're not you know, any better than regular characters. It's just the mobile devices have a variety of restrictions. Some are more powerful than others, but you kind of have to work with the lowest common denominator. Um, on the iOS, that would be the 3G. Um, super low power compared to the 3GS and even especially the iPhone 4, which is very powerful. The, also another difference between these two phones is this one is double the resolution. They're roughly the same size, but this has twice as many pixels, so it has to load twice as many pixels. It's, it's a lot to actually deal with, and in a lot of ways, this can sometimes run slower because it has so much more to, to work with. Same with the iPad. Um, it's got this huge screen, it 
these are actually very comparable pixel density. Um, this is 960 by 640, and this one is 1048 by 7, 1024 by 768. And so they're kind of close to each other, even though the screen is much bigger. There's there's going to be some hands-on stuff. Um, I'm not sure who all is going to be able to access it, but I think if you're using a computer at the school, you might be able to get to the files as well. So, all right. Um, <clears throat> so some of the restrictions. Uh, like I said, there's differences between all the devices, and you got to kind of consider the one that is the weakest. Um, so characters generally have to be low poly, and low poly is kind of a term that gets thrown around a lot at schools and at different things and it's it's sort of variable it depends on where you work as to what's considered low poly um, one of the games I worked on uh, I was limited to 4D triangles so that's 20 polygons <laughs> and it wasn't characters I was making boats but you know a 20 polygon boat you're basically working with a box and you can add some features but you gotta really pick what features you want to add um, and you know that is the lowest lowest poly I've ever heard of but still low poly you know could be anywhere between 20 and 5,000 um, I found that on the iPhone you want to keep characters down around I don't know probably our highest poly character would be like more than 600 triangles maybe more like a thousand triangles or something um, but it really depends on the game. Uh, games like Infinity Blade, their characters are super dense um, and their environments have tons of polygons for an iPhone game. Uh, but uh, they do a lot, a whole lot of technology to make that happen. They, they don't render a polygon, you know, they clip it precisely to the screen. They control exactly the view that you get when you're fighting a guy. So in general, especially if you're going to have a full 3D game with like multiple characters on the screen, Low poly is a whole different thing for the iPhone. It's much lower poly than you're probably used to hearing. Um, less memory. So iPhone 4 has only 512 memory, um, and the 3GS has 256. I want to say the 3G has even less, but I don't know. Um, so basically, that means you can only have so much texture loaded at once, uh, which means, you know, the specs are going to be a lot smaller. Uh, the programmers are going to come to the artists and say, hey, we need, we need half the size on this, and it still needs to look good. So you're going to be working with really small textures, um, and you'll have to come up with creative ways to make the most out of that. Uh, smaller processors. So this gets a little technical. Um, fill rate and texture switching or texture swapping are processor issues. Fill rate is basically um, when you have a PNG, PNGs are, are mostly what we use on the iPhone for textures. They're uncompressed and they just run right into the device. Uh, JPEGs, there has to be a little decompression process and it slows things down, so we try to avoid using JPEGs. Um, but when you have a PNG, it has alpha transparency. So if you have a character that's like in a sprite sheet and he's punching or something, this whole part here is just transparency because um, the end of the image is out here. And if there's an object behind it, it blends with that. If that has transparency, it blends with that. And every blend step is a hit on the processor. That's pretty substantial. Um, so you have to figure out ways to limit this empty transparency space, which we'll get into that later. And texture switching basically um, means every time you switch between different textures, um, if a character has several different animations and you're just loading different textures to play those, that's going to be a pretty, pretty heavy hit as well. Uh, smaller screen, this is a huge thing um, that kind of just gets uh, sort of neglected a little bit uh, a lot of times. It's, while you're making art, it's hard to consider the size that it's going to be because you're working on a giant screen. Everyone works on a huge monitor and then you're exporting it out to a device that's this big, you know. Um, 320 by 480 sounds like a lot of pixels but it's you know when you're holding it in your hand it's like the size of a business card it's so small so you have to do things with the character to make them pop out to make them read uh, we did a whole lot of stuff with army of darkness with the characters to exaggerate them they're super cartoony they're kind of bobble heady um, but we wanted to grab features from the movie and let the user like see those 
first and foremost before you know anything else so they can identify with the character and okay maybe his details on his armor aren't quite you know visible but he's got this giant head that you're like oh he has that helmet in the movie so I recognize him um, and actually a, a funny thing with uh, whoops with Bruce Campbell uh, <laughs> kind of made like his face very caricatured and his chin really big and stuff and uh, MGM was like, oh, you better be careful about that. You know, he's kind of sensitive about his chin and stuff. So he, he approved it. It was fine. It was just, I found it odd that uh, that would be a problem because it's a cartoon game, you know. I figured he'd be cool with that. Um, last is anti-aliasing, which a lot of game companies kind of just have built into their pipeline and built into their engine. Um, it is available to do on the iOS devices and on Droid, but it's a very expensive operation and with processor weaknesses and different things like that, it's, we try to avoid it. It's really, you only want to do anti-aliasing if you can basically cut down in every other area because it just takes a lot of bandwidth. Um, and if you don't do it, if you have a full 3D character that's modeled in like, you know, all polygons, he has skinning and everything, where his edges, you know, meet the environment, there'll be jagged lines, and those won't get smoothed unless you do anti-aliasing. And usually, we have it turned off because it takes a little too much power. Um, and then I sort of has a separate bullet point here: smaller studios. So, if you go out there and you're looking for, you know, to get into this kind of industry, to get into mobile development, smaller studios, you're going to have to be like figuring out problems yourself. You're going to have to work with their engine, simpler tech. Um, when I graduated way back, uh, <laughs> they were like, well, this is, you know, the pipeline. You're going to go to this company and they're going to have this engine all set up and it's going to be nice and wonderful and, you know, you'll just do your one thing. Uh, but I, I worked at Midway Games for a while and it was like that. Um, and it was all right. I didn't actually like working for a big company, so I went out searching for other jobs and. Uh, I ended up having a couple jobs like the one I have now where really they're developing their tech as they go and they don't have, you know, all the sort of importer, exporter kind of things that handle full 3D models and skinning and stuff. So, yeah, I've had to come up with a lot of creative ways to solve that. Uh, okay, so here's some solutions. Um, this one at the bottom is what we're going to be spending most of the day or time here on. Um, this is a gigantic texture atlas. <laughs> uh, it's not even the whole thing. You can see it kind of crops here, but this is for Army of Darkness, and it's got characters, it's got weapons, explosions, it's got all kinds of stuff in there. And the idea was to load this one image in, like, when you start the game, and it doesn't ever have to switch between characters or load news, so we completely got rid of texture switching um, by having a giant atlas. So atlases are big. They seem sort of like old school, like Mega Man, but they're actually still widely used in you know all sorts of flash and mobile development. So definitely know how to how to efficiently pack a texture, and uh, you know there's a lot of automated things out there. You can probably get like a third party texture packing system to take care of some of that too. Um, sprite she sprite sheets are similar, but it's for one animation usually. Um, and <clears throat> the downside between uh, sort of this and this is I've squared out one of the frames. And you can see all of this uh, sort of wasted space slash just transparency. So anything behind that, that's got to blend with. And if you have multiple characters all crunched together and they're all fighting, like that's a lot of blending of those different transparencies. So that's going to be a huge uh, hit. So it saves on polygons because there's none. It's just a spreadsheet. Uh, it saves on anti-aliasing because as long as it's an image and it doesn't go to the edge of a mesh or something, then it's pre-anti-aliased you know, anti -aliased and it's fine. Um, but it's hard on fill rate, like I said, because of all this transparency. And it's hard on memory because look how big this is. If he's your main character, he might have eight animations, and each one's going to just take up a huge amount of space. You want to have a decent frame rate. so. Um, and then programmatic animation can work for effects and things, but it is too much work for characters. You're not going to be like, all right, rotate elbow 15 degrees, and then it just, <laughs> that's something programmers will never do. 
um, rightfully so. So we came up with the 2D, 3D flat rig. Um, it saves on polygons. Uh, you'll see that later. It saves on anti-aliasing because it works similar to this, but it also saves on fill rate because it uses polygons to cut into that um, empty space. And then it also saves on memory because all you need is this one guy and you can make as many animations as you want, whereas this is very limited to texture. So we can get started. Um, I have on the, I don't know what drive he said that was, the Y drive, uh, a bunch of files in iPhone presentation, <laughs> nice and generic. Um, in there, there's a mixture of finished files, uh, working files, textures, etc. cetera. Um, if, you, if you're following along, I recommend starting with the Heavy Swordsman 01. Um, open that right up. It'll probably take a few minutes if it's the first opening of Max for the day. I think you guys have a ghosting thing here that resets it. Um, but basically, I'll just take you through the process of how we get a character from that stage to in the game. It's sort of tedious, um, kind of crazy, but it really saves on a lot of things, and it ended up looking pretty nice uh, in the end. So, Yeah, actually, you can see here, this is renders of the character. Uh, I'll just be chatting while you guys are opening Max. Uh, who all plans on following along with the files and models and stuff. Okay. Cool. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> well, I'm still going to do it anyways. Um, but So this is a render of the character, but this is the actual in-game character. Very little difference. Um, it's a pretty nice process because he maintains all of his lighting and stuff like that. Um, the way he moves is a little bit different because you know, his lighting won't move with him because it's all pre-rendered. And he's sort of like a puppet. Um, you've probably seen this sort of animation before. And I'll just show you, cut to the end briefly here for uh, this is what the final thing should look like. Come on. Here we go. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> You can see he's kind of uh, kind of got this really cartoony, you know, flat kind of motion to him, um, and you can imagine him maybe like a hundred times smaller than that because he's an iPhone character. Uh, but he still has a, some pretty nice motion, and um, when you consider how low poly he is, he's really just a series of of planes that's super super low poly. You can get a pretty nice look there. Um, and he's really easy to animate. You don't have to worry about, you know, all kinds of skinning and crazy problems because he's basically just a puppet. So it speeds up the whole process, really. So there he is in all of his glory. Um, now I will show you how to make him. So uh, when you start with one of these, you can start with a 3D character um, if you sort of already have that done or, you know, prefer that look. Uh, it definitely saves a lot of time to do it in 2D. Um, it not only cuts back on the, the seams. Here's an example of like sort of a, a map for a 2D guy. Um, you can see like the tail here could blend really nicely with this because they're flat colors and you won't see a seam there. Um, whereas this guy I've broken into pieces of armor and those can move kind of independently because the user is like, you know, well this is a whole separate piece of armor so of course, it's going to rotate, you know, on its own. But um, there's some some tricky stuff. And granted, this definitely saves time because you never have to model him, you never have to texture him, and you just draw it as is and put it together. So it does save time. But um, for this particular game, we wanted more of like a gritty kind of uh, realistic look. So we had the characters all modeled out. Um, we used them for a lot of different things, promo art and different fun stuff like that after the fact, but the main focus of modeling them out was to eventually cut them up. Um, and <clears throat> I have a camera in the scene that, whoops, I have a camera in the scene that 
please let me grab my camera. <laughs> so this is sort of the angle. I move the camera around from time to time, but basically this is the angle that we use. Um, and it's really important if you're working on a game like this to establish a really solid angle for all of your characters and things because if one's wrong, it's going to look really weird that he's walking in this different perspective, kind of. So all the characters have this camera rig and lighting. The lighting's all consistent as well because that's really important. If one character is really bright, one's dark, you know, you want to have consistent camera and lighting. So all of that is imported into each character file when we make them. And uh, I just would render out um, a few different angles. Um, you could render out kind of just one angle and cut them up like that, but I found it was best to, I would tilt like the head um, sort of at a, had set angles for each one, and I would play with that from time to time, but I think the head, I wanted more of a, oh God. Sorry guys. It's easier to do that. Really? No. Um, I think I had the head at 45 degrees, but then I, I left the chest at more of a, I don't know, like not quite as turned, maybe like a 30 or 20. Um, so you would see more of the actual details of, of the character's chest. They had, they had different um, you know, armor, they had different like, features. And you can see, it still looks OK. You can see his chest is almost facing the camera, where his head is almost profile. And it actually looks fine. It you know, animates all right. And you see the parts of the character that you want. Um, and you can see here, the hands are completely profile. I mean, it's, you're looking right at the front of the hand there, whereas the rest of him. So he's rendered out at a bunch of different angles to get the look that we wanted for each piece. Um, so basically, uh, yeah, I, I would render all these pieces out um, and end up with something similar. Photoshop. parts, to all these parts here, um, you can kind of see the different angles. And I didn't probably use all of them. Um, like, this is what I probably used for the head. Um, it's, it's got a pretty nice distance um, between the torso and his little uh, bandana there, which then I eventually cut out separately. and then. It's got a nice angle, sort of mostly profile of his head. Uh, for the chest, this is what I use for the chest. And um, for the legs, completely profile for the legs. Same with the hands. And um, two different views of the hands. You know, one's in front, one's behind. And that's kind of the whole character right there. Um, the chest is also on this character kind of attached to his, uh, whoops. attached to his waist parts here. Um, so that's funny, his helmet's kind of a little off of his face. But really, the only important part of this was uh, his chest parts here. Um, probably came in like this to cut it out. <clears throat> and the fun thing is, if you guys have characters of your own um, and you wanted to animate them puppet style or whatever, it would be really easy to just do some simple renders, cut them up, and do this process on them. So that's kind of his torso. Um, I probably went in with the clone stamp or something of that nature and you know, filled in the parts that were missing um, and basically rounded that thing out um, to look kind of nice as is. Let's see here, staying on track with this. So, <coughs> yeah, creating the camera and locking it, it's important. Um, running out the multiple angles, and then remove parts when needed. So, you can see, 
if I just rotate, let's say, sometimes I'll just delete things. Like, all right, right now I'm focusing on, you know, the torso. So this arm here is covering the torso quite a bit. Um, I would just go in and delete out stuff if it's in the way. Um, and this is actually covering it too. So, and then I'd take a render of that and pull everything back in on top of it. Um, sometimes in Photoshop, you might need to darken certain parts um, because if you take a render like this, uh, this character actually has some shadowing kind of baked into his texture. But that's still pretty bright right there, and there's actually a shine going on. If we put a piece of armor over top of that, it's going to not look at all right. Um, the shine's going to be showing underneath, and there's going to be weird things. So you might have to go in and darken some of this to show that there will be a piece of armor over top of that later. Um, and that, you know, that all is part of the process. And you can kind of tweak as you go, because once you get them into Photoshop, you can do whatever you want. So after a whole lot of cutting, <laughs> um, and these files are in the, uh, in the folder here. So if you want to just jump ahead to this. Weird. Dang it. Sorry, guys. No Photoshop. Awesome. So, anyways, <laughs> after a whole lot of cutting and positioning, um, I ended up with something like this. Uh, this is one of the first characters, so his um, size is not really a good size. And <clears throat> when you start working with them in this stage, especially when you're rendering and the images out, I would render it like a lot higher than you're going to go with because you end up rotating things and cutting and painting on things and shrinking them down and doing things. It, they'll, they'll lose quality if you're scaling them and rotating them a lot. So um, if they're much bigger, then you end up with like this thing would be, you know, twice as big when you scale it all down, then it just kind of makes the quality consistent across the board. Um, also, I try to work in a power of two. This guy's not in a power of two, so bad. <laughs> um, he should be probably 256 square. Um, and generally, iPhone and mobile devices always use power of two. Some engines allow for uh, like an auto expand. So if it was 257, the engine would automatically expand that to 512. It would just jump up to the next power of two, which is really bad. It's really wasteful. So in general, you want to work in powers of two. Um, this example is not. He's probably an early stage of the character. but So that's kind of it. He's, he's packed into um, roughly as, as close as he can get. But I leave a little more space than you would leave like in sort of your average texture for, let's say, if you were painting a character. Um, which I have an example of his texture. I mean, you can see here. What? I'm having trouble opening files today. Heavy swordsman. His his texture. There's no room. I mean, everything's completely packed together, and that's that's a good texture. That's how it should be. Um, but for this kind of setup, you're going to need room to cut in these polygons. And if a polygon is right up against the edge of a texture, it's going to get aliased. And that's going to look bad. So you want to actually have a little bit of buffer around all of these. And that's kind of why it looks a little more spread out. Um, so yeah, this one's a little bit close to the edge. It's not ideal. Um, but it's got some room over here. So you'll see how that plays in. Uh, so, let's say you've, you've done all your renders, um, you got all your nice angles, you took it into Photoshop, touched them up, cut things out. Um, I find that circles work best for joints because they just have a nice um, omnidirectional spin to them. If 
you had a character who had a joint on his elbow and it wasn't a circle, it was maybe a sort of squared off kind of end. When his elbow bends, there's gonna be like a hole here that's like a sort of triangle spaced hole. If they were both circles, there would just be like nothing. You wouldn't, it would just be a perfect elbow. Um, so I try to stick to circles. It's kind of weird because it doesn't always work right. So sometimes you need to throw in like some pieces to kind of round it out or um, on certain characters you can get away with like different cutting different things in. Oh, well maybe his boot just goes up a little higher. So then that's a nice little rounded area. And then you want to consider the layering because um, if you know that this hand is going underneath something, you're not going to see a whole lot of this detail. Also, it's, you're going to want to darken this if it's going underneath, you know, like it's got a shadow on top of it. This is clearly going on top um, and this is darkened because that's going to go underneath. So some of that you can do after the fact. Once you get the character like built, you can start darkening things and adding in the kind of layering effects that you need later. But um, when you cut this character up, you want to consider some of the layering because um, there's a lot of things you can save time on. One other example is his foot. I realize it's a profile foot. I only need one foot. So I'm using this for both the left and right leg. Um, the hands, you can see different views of the hands, so I did do two separate hands. Um, and then I also consolidated this one down. I decided we have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight bones on this guy. And he was one of the first characters, so we wanted to be kind of conservative, so I merged these two. So his arm is completely straight um, on the one side of his body the whole time. But the way he holds his sword, he doesn't really have a lot of like room and he also has a joint here that I use pretty um, pretty uh, I guess I don't know what's the word I'm looking for a lot <laughs> so export okay so you've cut him up and this is what he ends up looking like when you finish the thing and I'm going to take it through the process of cutting all this stuff out and whatnot. He was made in 2010, um, 3ds Max 2010, so he has different settings and stuff. Self-illumination works different than those. Um, so before we get into cutting him up, I just want to show you a little bit about kind of the final product. Uh, this guy, we could have saved a lot. Again, he was a uh, earlier character, so we weren't sure on polygon limits. Um, he's 122 polys, and we could have saved a lot of fill rate by cutting in additional polygons, because uh, when it comes to iPhone, generally fill rate is a worse problem than polygons. You want to kind of strike a nice, happy medium, but um, this, is, this is actually pretty good. His foot kind of takes up most of that area, and it's kind of still nice and blocky doesn't waste a whole lot of polygons or space. Um, but there's a lot of empty space in here that we could have gotten rid of in retrospect. So I'm going to go ahead and hide this guy and start a fresh one to show you how it works. OK. Um, so I usually just start with just a regular plane. Um, and UV or UVW map is the way to go with this. Um, but I've seen a lot of people do it differently. They'll come in and cut into like uh, an image using the cut tool. Uh, I do it a little bit differently, but then thing is still the same. Um, and then you have your material over here. Um, it's important when you're working with these to drop in an instance into the, uh, gosh, where is this? So you just drag, if you work in this view, I prefer the material editor like this because it's easier to see things, I think. Um, but here's his diffuse, and uh, I just drag and drop an instance of that onto the opacity. It's already got the transparency built in, and then all you have to do is click alpha output. It's standard. Um, Default setting is 
set to RBG or RGB intensity, but just turn that to alpha, and you can see up here that it's um, changing from white to transparent. It's pretty simple. Um, and then that'll get it so you can actually see what parts are uh, transparent one or not. <laughs> that just screwed that up. Hello. What the heck? So it should look like that. OK. Weird. Anyways. Um, so the other thing you want to do, it just so happens that I made a plane that's roughly the right size. But uh, you want to make sure the plane is the exact size. Otherwise, you're going to have like some stretching and stuff. Um, it's a weird size, 274 by 241, but um, whatever. Width, 274, 241. OK, so I did this a little early. Um, so now he's, he's exactly the size that he should be. And then I put the UVW on there. Dang it, oops. I should convert this to an editable poly first because we are going to edit it, but we don't want to collapse in the UVW with, <coughs> with that because we're going to edit underneath that. Um, so you've probably seen and used this uh, show end result. If you don't, you're like going to move a thing. Oh, God, it's looking horrible. Um, you just turn that on, and it shows what it will really look like at the top of the stack. So. Um, and basically, he's got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight parts. So we're just going to make eight things. So there we go. Um, don't worry too much about like positioning them or whatever. It's not really important. And you just start with one, start cutting them up. Um, the way I do it, it's kind of odd. Uh, I start by isolating kind of the one that I want. Let's start with the torso. So I get as close as I can. Um, and I'm not going to be super picky with how, <coughs> like how much <coughs> fill rate or polygons I save, but. That's the whole idea behind this process. So you want to be kind of um, attentive to that. So what I did there was just grab these two, you know, and I, I put a cut in between um, just by hitting connect. And it makes a, uh, an edge, but it also makes two vertices. I just delete the edge because we don't need it. We do need the vertices, though, here and here. Those are sort of like anchors, so then we can move other parts. and. You kind of just start working out the detail like that. Um, connect. Delete the edge. You can come in and do more of this kind of stuff. Um, if you see it's <coughs> starting to cut into the character, that's bad. Anytime uh, the texture meets the edge like that, you're going to get an A-laced line. It's going to be really ugly. So you have to pull it back out. So I guess I saved a little more space, but I added several more polygons. So maybe that was actually sort of efficient the way we had it before. Um, but it's just sort of trying to maximize your use of space. I could probably get rid of this too, but it would add a couple more polygons. and. For the purposes of this workshop, I'm just going to call that guy good. Um, and then I usually just like to affect pivot point, center to object, just for now, for organization. Otherwise, you'll end up with weird pivot points everywhere. So when you're trying to position your stuff just for the um, short term, it's kind of messy. Uh, yeah, so let's do another piece here. We got my first step is isolating the piece that you want, turning on that thing. So I'm going to do the sword here. 
And this is kind of a tricky piece because it's got the hand built in. So ideally, you're going to want to have this space be gone as well as this. Um, and I've put it pretty close up to other textures, so I actually have to cut this space out or it's going to show other parts of his body. Um, just come in, make a couple more verts. I keep deleting the edge. Um, it's sort of a weird thing, but again, there are many ways to do this. This is just the way I prefer doing it. Um, you know, I'll go ahead and show you the other way that a lot of the other artists do it. I'll pull this out here. Uh, they use cut. It's sort of the same thing, but they get to pick exactly, you know, where they want their vertices to go. Um, it is sort of more helpful, and they, they end up deleting that as well. It's more helpful because you can kind of pick the precise spot, which a lot of times with this, it is kind of precise. Um, I just like to do it after I cut it. So, eh, I can make it more efficient, but for now, let's call that good. Um, there are a lot of parts to cut out here. Uh, but, <clears throat> let's see, is, is anyone else following along, or how far behind are people? Just kind of playing with the character. No? Okay, cool. So, I mean, I could go through and cut up all the different pieces and show you, but you kind of get the idea. Um, it's basically just drawing a mesh around it. And, you know, you end up with, if you see in this top viewport, it's kind of hard to see, but everything's on this line. And it's kind of hard to tell what's going on, you know. Uh, the character does have some depth. And from engine to engine, the depth that you put into the character could cause problems, and it could, you know, be necessary as well. For Army of Darkness, we needed some depth to show that, you know, this piece was in front of this piece. But if we stretched them out like a ton, let's say, you know, oh, we want the sword in the front, so grab the sword here. We pulled the sword all the way out so it was like that far forward. Other characters could potentially be in front of that, or you know, and there's problems that would happen. So we kept a pretty minimal amount of depth. I'd zoom way in and just be like, think, sword's in front, technically. <laughs> um, and sometimes Max will have a hard time like dealing with that. <laughs> uh, as you can see, I mean, on the left here, you can see the sword is very clearly in front of the torso. It just is. Um, but as I move it back, it's still in front, but Max can't handle that <laughs> little amount of distance there. And it's, it's a really flat object, so it just, it's having a hard time rendering it um, in order, which is fine. Um, and that's actually a new thing with 2012. 2010 handles it up to the last you know, decimal, so. <coughs> um, so when, once you get all the pieces cut up, you want to kind of position them like basically where they're going to go. Um, and at this point, their centers would be like just centered on their objects. Uh, and once you get everything positioned, don't worry about pivot points. Don't worry about any of that stuff. You're like, OK, this is basically, what the heck? You're like, okay, this is basically how the character is going to be. Maybe you had to do some scaling, like, oh man, this sword's really big. Make it, oops, make it smaller. Or you know, it's not big enough, giant sword. Um, but once you get everything set up, scaled right, positioned right, maybe its pivot points aren't correct, but it's ready to go. Um, do I have something locked here? I do. Okay. Then. Let's say this was the full character. You grab all his parts. Um, because you've scaled things and you've done weird things with pivot points um, that are just sort of generic, you've messed around with the verts and stuff, he's not, he's not rigged, he's not linked at this point, so it's OK to just reset his X form, which is a good idea to do with a lot of things um, that are going to go into an engine. Um, it just kind of just brings him back to a nice zeroed place. I did it twice. I don't know. For some reason, I always do it a couple times.
guys can't hear me? Okay. <clears throat> so, once you got the reset X form on there, you can just convert to editable poly. It collapses the whole thing. It also collapses the UVW you had on there. So if you, you know, you got to make sure you saved it and you're ready and you have like a backup because once you do that, you kind of are stuck with the positioning of it. Um, if you didn't do that, you could, in theory, you know, do stuff to whatever, change the coordinates. <laughs> That's funny. I didn't even notice this is actually wrong, but shouldn't be a problem. So you've, you've positioned everything, you've cut it all up, it's ready to go, did your X form, stop it. Collapse it down. Um, then comes linking, um, which I'll pull up the original character and unlink all this stuff, and then show you how to do all that from scratch. Oh, this is fun. Um, since he was the first character, we actually used bones on him. Um, and then later, we wrote some code that we didn't need bones, so we got rid of those. Uh, but he actually has a weird little rig that doesn't do anything but just move the planes. There's no skinning or anything like that. Um, we just had to have it for technical reasons. Uh, but uh, there shouldn't be any reason why you can't just link the bones in most engines. Um, and again, when I talk about the engine, it's it's sort of just what our company made. It's not, you know, like Unreal or anything like that. It's just code that our company has come up with and maintains. <coughs> so, so kind of got him posed here, um, and you want to make sure his pivot points are where the rotations are going to be. So, this one, it's kind of messy, kind of hard to see. Um, I don't know if it would help some people to go to uh, wireframe mode, wherever you are. Oh, actually, that's much worse. <laughs> Stop it. No, don't want. Realistic mode. Shaded mode. OK. How do I get rid of this thing? <coughs> so that's actually pretty decent. Um, pivot point spot, might move it more towards the ball of his shoulder, like where it's actually going to be. This is sort of like rigging, um, because you got to kind of consider the mechanics of the character and how he'll animate, how you want him to animate. Um, let's see. Make sure I got the local coordinates, too. Because <clears throat> you also want to keep it kind of straight, you know, like you don't want it already kind of pre-rotated. Um, you want it to line up with the position of his limbs. And that's a pretty good spot for that one. Um, this will probably rotate from around here. And he's already sort of posed. Uh, I would recommend kind of starting him with like a T-pose where his limbs are kind of straight out like that and his legs are straight down. It just makes it easier to make sure everything's nice and straight. Uh, and then his bandana thing. You know, you can't, you can't leave the pivot point there because it'll rotate like this. <laughs> Not the ideal rotation. Uh, move the pivot point up to the ball here, and then it'll swing nicely from that point. This one's tricky, because his hand is attached to it. Um, so you actually don't rotate from the point of the sword. You rotate from his wrist. Um, that's what's actually swinging there. It's kind of weird. And there is another piece back behind that it attaches to. It's his uh, forearm piece. I'll pull those out for a second, make sure everything's lined up. And fix the 
to the point on this one. So uh, you can also start linking once you get the pivot points done. Uh, you know, arm bone connects to the shoulder bone. <laughs> uh, please. <laughs> I think that worked. Yeah. So I don't know how much experience people have had with linking and building rigs. Uh, it's really, really simple. Uh, these are your two link controls. They're pretty much just available at all times in Max. And you always go from child to parent. So um, just kind of a rule of thumb, you say, I want this to follow this one. Um, and then that's the parent. In, <clears throat> I don't know why it's not blinking. Normally when you do a successful link, I would drag it over here. See, you can't, oh, you can't link to that. And then once you can link to something, it shows that signal, and then it would normally blink the parent. So you know that's the parent of this child, et cetera. Um, and the kind of the rule with uh, hierarchy in Max is children can, they can go wherever. Oh, is it crashing? <laughs> nope, all right. Children can go wherever. Um, and this is exceptionally useful with a rig like this because it doesn't use bones. You can actually detach things that are children and then the parent still has control. Um, that's really useful for cartoony animation where, you know, their head might come off their shoulders a little bit or like um, with these characters specifically, there's a lot of like, you know, floating joints. Um, not only when, it, when he attacks, not only does his shoulder rotate, but it actually moves backward on his body and comes forward. It adds a lot more power to his movements. And you couldn't normally do that with bones. Bones don't let you just move a child off to the left or something. So I've connected this to this, and then I'm going to go ahead and link that to the torso. All set. So torso moves, arm moves. Only a couple things left to link. Um, so I'm not going to link the legs to the torso because, uh, oh geez, he's got a shoulder piece back there. Uh, the reason I'm not going to link the legs to the torso is because you can't actually use IK um, with something this simple. And IK is what, geez, did that backwards. IK is what sort of determines a, uh, a nice foot plant, inverse kinematics. And that's fancy stuff, but um, much too fancy for this kind of rig. I mean, we're trying to save on polygons down to, you know, the very smallest amount. Um, so one way to do it is to create a root object. Um, <clears throat> OK, almost done here. Yay, OK, so his whole torso, all of his arm pieces, everything's ready to go. Um, later, I can work on positioning that so his sword actually sits in his other hand, but uh, yeah, close enough. Um, so the object can be anything. You just want to um, make sure it's whatever engine you're working in that it doesn't get rendered for the best you know, solution, I would say points. Those almost always work with every engine and they, they don't render um, just sort of by default. So you make a point. I like to turn on the box, see it a little better in all viewports. And then, uh, shucks. Let's put it up here. So let's call it his hips. So it's like sort of a synthetic representation of a, a hip there. Um, but it can move around and nothing will be attached to it and it'll be fine. You know, So it won't be like his hips are moving independently. And link the feet to that and then link the hip bone to the torso. You know what? Actually, let's just link it to nothing right now. 
because again, we don't want to have any of the feet coming back to the torso. So let's, we got the hips and we got the root. So yeah, you definitely actually, you need a root bone if you're going to do this broken rig kind of thing. When I refer to a broken rig, it means um, the hierarchy doesn't uh, necessarily all come back in the same way. Uh, the feet have their own hierarchy and they link to the root separately from the torso. So it's like the feet are essentially broken off of the rig and that's what's going on there. So okay, link this to this. Okay, so if you ever want to move the whole character, everything all at once, you can't. <laughs> There. <laughs> uh, yeah, you ever want to move the whole character, you move the root. If you just want to move the torso and everything that's attached, his arms, his head, bandana thing, you can move the torso. And then um, if you want to move both feet but not the torso, you have this. So there's a lot of control you can do here. And uh, it's kind of goofy, but the way we animated. The way we animated the characters in Army of Darkness, um, their walk cycles were pretty hilarious. Uh, they just had this kind of one foot in front of the other kind of thing. I would just slide one forward, slide one back. <laughs> wow, he's totally walking, for real. <laughs> uh, I mean, you can't just leave it like that, but uh, that's kind of the basis for the walk. Uh, I would then go in and be like, okay, I'll go halfway in between this. And he lifted his foot up. So now it's getting a little more walky. And same with this one. Lifts his foot up about there. And uh, you know, you mix in a little bit of bounce with when he, um, In, in a walk cycle, your torso moves up when, you know, at sort of the lift phase. Uh, and then you'd probably be back down right here. You just copy these keys. It's kind of a quick and dirty version. <laughs> Moved him forward. Whoops. Uh, delete those. Whoops. Uh, so you can't move them forward. <laughs> Otherwise, that's pretty visible. Uh, and to copy a key, just hold shift and move it. Copies it. It's pretty simple. Okay. Oh, OK. So there he is walking. It's really crude. Um, and uh, after only maybe like an hour, you could have some really nice animations on this guy. Um, He's much easier to animate than like a standard 3D model with skinning and, again, other problems that could involve a much more complicated rig with IK and gimbal lock and all kinds of stuff. He's just a puppet. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I like to take advantage of, of the rig and like what it can do. Um, for example, breaking the rig is one way to get this sort of uh, foot motion going. But you can also, depending on the engine, um, again, you really got to make sure you know what it can support. But non-uniform scaling is pretty cool. Uh, so you just scale them up on the Y and you can scale them on the... Now it's scaling everything. If you wanted to be really uh, particular, you could counterscale his other objects like his hands and things so only his torso is doing it. But basically what I'm trying to achieve here is a simple like, actually I did it on the wrong frame, but a simple squash and stretch kind of thing. Which is kind of odd to have on an armored character, but uh, you know, the game was kind of goofy. Um, cartoony sort of animation, so the more you can put into it, I felt like it was better. Now this is extreme squash and stretch, but then again, the character's gonna render it something like that big. So you need all the motion you can get. Um, <laughs> he's like made of rubber. Uh, 
right, last tape on the how to make a flat rig. Uh, actually, let's see if we've gone through all of our stuff here. Uh, I was supposed to be staying on track. Um, so consider joints, circles work best. I talked about that. Uh, Army of Darkness, we ended up stretching out uh, by the end of the project our limitation to 11 parts. And we only use 11 because ours go to 11, but also because <laughs> uh, it you can't have too many parts, you know, because then it starts to be a performance hit and then you're losing some of the advantage that you worked for in the first place. Um, and <clears throat> we, don't, we don't use 11 for every character. We save 11 for like the heroes or like an exceptionally interesting character that might have wings or some elaborate stuff. We try to stay around 9, um, but the top level is 11. This guy down here is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And he has a dual split wing, so it actually has two points of flapping. Um, but that's kind of more fancy. And also, this game wasn't nearly as real time as this game. This game, uh, you it's an action game, so you're running left and right and shooting. And you know, if it skips a frame, that could result in your character dying, which really ticks off the user. So we had to be more conservative with these guys. And with this one, is more of a simple kind of farming game. So it's it's not as important that you have a super clean frame rate. Uh, working powers of two, cover that. Creating the mesh cutouts. Remove the unnecessary edges. Um, you might see that there are sort of weird polygon shapes in here, and some of them have a lot of sides, and you generally want to avoid having more than a four-sided polygon. But <coughs> In this case, uh, we export the characters anyways, and it gets triangulated on the way out. And it worked pretty well. The triangulation uh, that the exporter did was more efficient than probably what I would have done. And it just saved time to not try and make everything perfectly squares. Um, so we, we just deleted middle edges out, and we just let it take care of that on the export. Um, reset the X forms, link the parts, break the rig when possible. Um, a root bone may be needed, almost always is needed. And one thing I didn't go over is naming is important. Um, I bet this guy's not named. Oh no, he is. Awesome. So when we first started out, we were just kind of just making the characters and testing them out. And then we got about four characters deep and we're like, we want to do more things with them. We're wanting to attach fire to the characters when they're flaming um, or swap out their shield, or perhaps give them a bigger, more fancy golden sword, um, different fun upgrades and things, and it was getting difficult to do that because we didn't name things right and we didn't have a system set up for that. Um, later we developed it, but that's something that, as a lessons learned, um, if you ever are working with a system that has a bunch of characters that are puppets like this, you know, throw out the idea of, hey, are we going to swap parts on these characters? Because if so, you know, we need to develop a system. Sword is not good enough. Um, although naming these bones is really helpful for the programmers because they can see them all um, and potentially debug and find the bone that's a problem. But sword wasn't good enough. We needed something more generic. We ended up changing it to just like bone weapon. I know it's not a bone, but it was represented as a bone in the game. Um, and we ended up changing out weapons on different characters. Um, skeletons were a base skeleton, and they had, it was a really weird rig. All they had was a torso, um, one arm, two feet, and like no head, and it was just this weird character. And they had points for their other spots that um, I would animate as if there was something there. And that would be subbed in for a shield or if they were a shieldless skeleton, they would just have an arm, or they would have a big fancy shield, or their head was subbed in for different helmet types, and their other hand was subbed in for different swords and axes. And so we were able to make like a whole skeleton army off of that by swapping out parts, um, which is really a, a nice um, advantage of these. You can also blow parts off of a character when they're sort of rigged up with this broken rig set. Um, you know, you can. You can blow them off programmatically um, with 
uh, sort of uh, algorithm. We had a couple pieces go flying off the skeletons as you're shooting them. The first step, it shoots off their shield, and then it shoots their head off, and it lines up with how much life they have left. Um, but also, later, the animators could just animate the skeletons falling apart in their die sequence. Um, all the human characters kind of fall over dead, but the skeletons crumble, and it's kind of fun. And only really possible with this rig. If you tried to pull that off with a, a full 3D character that has skinning, you'd have to do some pretty advanced cutting and different things to get something to fall apart like that. Um, and yeah, this kind of the last one here. <clears throat> Some engines don't support non-uniform, squash and stretch, scaling. So you got to watch out for that. It can be pretty ugly and uh, cause weird problems that are hard to diagnose. Um, Keyframes, keep them organized. So one thing we had to do with, and we still continue to do, is we come up with a sprite sheet for all the animations. So this is it. He's got all of his animations in this one big file. Um, and it's important to have that because if you start splitting it up in the files and you unknowingly make a change to the model, um, then that file won't work with all the other animations, et cetera. So it's important to keep them all in one thing. Because if I decided to you know, add a vert or something randomly because of some technical reason, then that would break all the other files. But since it's all one, it saves it in with all the animations and it works. Um, but we also have to keep our keyframes organized. Um, weird. Oh yeah, because he's got bones. Weird. Uh, what a mess. So if you look at all that down there, there are a lot of keyframes and if you had kept track of these, I mean, it's kind of, it's not fun to try and figure out the last frame of his walk cycle and, you know, okay, I think it goes to 20, but does it loop perfectly with zero and it kind of gets messy. So as you go, try and write down your keyframes and keep track of them because you usually have to give that to the programmers and say his walk cycle is from this to this. Um, in our case, we had an export button that would save it out, um, but we still had to go 20. And then once all the frames are in the timeline there, then we would export it. <clears throat> but anytime you go back and edit a character and you want to edit a specific cycle, you'd have to know where that was in his file. So that was definitely helpful. Uh, and then take advantage of the rig, because these characters can do all sorts of fun things um, that you can't really do with a lot of uh, more advanced rigs. All his animations here. So he had all the characters have two different attacks. He has like his heavy swing and then just a stab. Um, hide his bones here. He's got to celebrate. It doesn't seem like much, um, but when it loops, he just sits there, sort of fist pumping, and then he dies at the end. <laughs> and then after he died, we realized that we needed idols for the character. <coughs> Originally, when we started, we thought they were just going to be only walking forward, attacking, or dying. That is all the characters will do. They'll never have, like, why would they idle? Because they're constantly fighting. Um, but there were instances we found that they would have to idle. For example, if they get to the end of the level and there's no enemies there, they would stop and idle because there's nothing to do. Or um, certain things like oh, if the screen has to pause or you know, if they get stunned, there's instances we had. So we ended up adding the idol after, and it, he like raises from the dead. Um, but yeah, that's kind of it. Uh, it's 10 10, so I guess we got a whole ton of time. Uh, does anyone have any questions about anything? <laughs> um, it can be about the character or process, it can be about Backflip Studios in general, because um, Pretty good at answering questions. So, you're correct. Yeah. so, when you went through and you had to work with the IP, I guess, of, uh, of Army Darkness, how much control did you have over where you were going? Like, did you get to choose everything, or did they come in and say, this is what we want? Yeah, MGM was amazing. Like, they are not, I 
guess, interested in being really like controlling on the IP. Um, they're interested in just getting their IP on mobile devices and getting some fun games out there. The process they're going through right now is just kind of handing it out to developers and they're not picking like big studios like EA, they're picking smaller studios and um, yeah, they're being really flexible about it. So when I went out there and kind of pitched our direction to them, they were totally like into it. In fact, um, they <laughs> they almost had no critique on it. Uh, they did say to make sure there is some blood uh, because the initial pitch was very friendly, no blood. It was just like dust coming off the characters um, and they would like get knocked out. <laughs> uh, but there's certain reasons we were trying to do that because the iPhone is super casual. It's like really cutesy and stuff but Overall, they didn't have any problems with like the way we did the characters, and we only took one part of the movie. I don't know if you played the game, but we basically just took the uh, castle attack scene at the end, and you basically defend against waves of skeletons and things, and evil Sheila comes in, and the evil ashes come in, and there's all this stuff. But yeah, they, we showed them everything. They didn't have any problem with it. So, And we also got to use all of the audio from like the studio recordings which was really cool. So you had like all these tracks of like just like Bruce Campbell grunting like <laughs> in a sound room or something. <laughs> it's pretty interesting. What you, you had another? Yeah, so um, how much documentation do you do personally as the art director before you go in? Like do you make mood boards and color palettes and all that or are you guys kind of? Yeah. So I had a presentation about our, our process a little bit yesterday. Um, that is dependent on the game. So like Paper Toss, we made in two weeks. That was like ridiculously short. And we'll probably never make a game in that short amount of time, but if you know, make a game in two weeks, you kind of only get one or two days of concept. Um, and it was really simple. It was just like a couple pictures from Google we kind of threw together and we're like, this is the feel, that's it. <laughs> and a couple really rough whiteboard sketches. Like that was it. Um, Army of Darkness, we did a pretty sizable amount of concept art. Um, all the characters were concepted out. Uh, the little castle environment was concepted out. <coughs> we did take a lot of reference from the movie, so it varies from project to project. Uh, question? Another question? Um, it might be a little over technical, but um, when you make transparent, things. I've noticed like usually when you do a texture for a full 3D object, if you're doing like a yellow flower, you have to make it yellow behind it so that even when you make the alpha map. And so I noticed that you didn't like make it black or something behind it. So did it, was it just really clean and you never had a problem with that or? Uh, Am I making sense? No, no, you're making sense. I'm just trying to think back. Render him this, in this workshop? I think I might have. Um, yeah, no, that's, that was a problem. We actually had to clean up some of the characters. It's not as big of a deal with the armor. You can kind of get away with like a gray tone. And I'm pretty sure that's a max specific thing. I don't know why it does that. Um, you're talking about basically the edge. Yeah. It gets a weird edging. Yeah. It does it in Maya too. Right? It does it in Maya? Okay, I feel better now. <laughs> so it's not just max, perfect. I have no, I've had more um, experience getting a better result with, let's see. <laughs> Desktop. Okay, it's falling down, you do an update. It'll have another spike, but it, it doesn't really lift it. It just kind of spikes and then goes back to where it was. So we, we do updates, but the benefit is sort of minimal, I guess. Um, yesterday, we just came out with a game called Dragon Veil. Um, I kind of see where it's at. <laughs> uh, but we do plan on updating that one extensively. Uh, it's a, a social game, so it's kind of like Farmville with dragons, sort of but it's more fun. It uses this process. It uses these character kind of setups. Uh, it's got a flat 2D look to it. Oh, it's number 18. Awesome. Yes. 
Um, and actually, one of the characters in the presentation is from that game. And we're going to update that one a ton. So more dragons, more everything. Did you have a question? Yeah. Do you guys want t-shirts? You guys, did you answer the question? Oh uh, yeah, I know I had a question. Oh yeah, what's your question? Okay, um, I've noticed a lot of your games have like, well, except for this dragon one, have kind of like a similar artistic style. Where would you guys say that you like draw your inspiration for your artistic direction from? Oh man, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, a lot of sources. Um, <clears throat> like the artistic style of most of our games, you know, is that's all determined by me. Um, I really like 3D kind of renders. I like uh, a lot of saturation in my art. Um, but the the bigger we get, the more artists join the team. You know, the more their input um, gets in there. A lot of the dragons were sort of uh, inspired by a whole bunch of different things. We had a concept artist um, working on those. He came from Insomniac Games. Um, a lot of the council guys are looking to get out of the council industry and get into something that has higher release rates, you know. Our games come out like three months. Yeah, so you guys have, how, like, so would you say it's uh, like more normal for a, a console developer to come over to the mobile? Like, is that like a trend? That is a trend. That is definitely a trend. Not only is it sort of uh, exploding right now, like, money-wise, um, everyone's making money in this mobile sector. Also Facebook, um, huge, huge right now. But it's sort of, it's, it's got a lot of advantages. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit at my presentation later, but it's just not the two-year grind kind of thing, you know, which is, you, you get this beautiful, like, work of art, and it's amazing by the end of the two years, but it's like, that's your two years. Um, <coughs> project. Who decides your next project? Is it uh, a collaborative effort, or is uh, it a... So... Allow pitches to come from anywhere. Like, you can be an intern and you can pitch an idea. Um, so we have pitch meetings, like, every month, and the resulted pitches of that kind of filter down to the three founders and me, and we just, like, go through the, the different ideas and decide on which ones are awesome and whatever. And if your idea gets picked, then you basically are the mega lead on that game. Um, Army of Darkness was mine. I was like, oh, I love Army of Darkness. So, I'll, I'll get, <laughs> actually. Um, so, you were talking earlier that you have to develop for every phone. Um, and you say you have to base it on everything, but you've got all these different resolutions. So when you're making something, you're talking about like uh, screen space, and optimizing it for that. Do you really go by the lowest one, even though most of your sales are probably going to be on a 4G? That is an excellent point. Um. So performance-wise, we go by the lowest one. Um, so we want to, because believe it or not, there are a ton of 3GSs out there. I don't know what sort of the population numbers on it, but a while back it was like half. Um, and they don't go away, so we have to make sure half of our users are still getting just as good of a game. Uh, so performance-wise, we base it on the lowest, but art-wise, we base it on the highest. So um, we haven't really done anything yet. The, the next games that are coming out, we're doing them at 4X, is what we're calling it. Uh, iPhone 4 is 2X, which is basically iPad, um, but 4X would be like Mac, you know, just full screen HD. Um, which is kind of ridiculous for a mobile game, but basically we make everything really big and then we scale down, scale down, scale down, scale down. Some, like some of the different devices are super, super small. Like original iPhone 320 by 480 is kind of as small as it gets. So all these things need to have a, an HD version and a tiny version. So um, you do, sorry, you oh. do have two different versions that you put out there? Like you a yeah. large version of that model, then you have the... Um, there's often droid versions, 
um, depending on how the game works. And there's a, there's an iPad, iPhone 4, 3G are the kind of the three. iPad and iPhone 4 are often the same, but they have sort of a safe area. iPad's a little wider, so we'll fill that with like extra background or kind of slide the UI out a little bit. So. How much extra work? I'm oh, sorry. No, I'm sorry. How much extra work is it? Do you create everything and then you rescale it just when you export it? Or do you, yeah, so it's not that much? Yeah, we um, We try and test on the iPhone as we're going with like the higher res assets and usually it's really slow and crappy, but we try and keep it going. And then once we get to kind of a critical point where we have everything like looking nice, um, we'll do like a batch export to shrink everything down to the iPhone and, and then we can kind of tweak from there. Okay, he's done, <laughs> right. Um, with this process that you're doing, I noticed your original model was like a low quality, like a low poly model and yeah. so it's low quality. And as much as I like the charm of that, I mean, you could have theoretically done like a movie quality model and then done this, the planes. Yeah, no, that makes total sense um, because the way uh, you know, renders out, you can have a million polygons, it doesn't matter. Um, mainly the reason for keeping it low poly is just sort of an internal choice. Um, like, hey, I kind of like the look of low poly stuff, um, but mostly it's because we need to keep the turnaround fast. This game had like 26 different characters. Each character had eight to 10 animations. Um, so lower poly tends to be a faster pipeline. Also, um, it's, it keeps like uh, texture like work and unwrapping and stuff. All of the whole process of creating the model is faster. So, and then in the end, when we come up with like promo art, it's easier to import like a half dozen characters or even more, and you can just like render out a nice little scene with them. If each character was like fifty thousand polygons, it would kind of be just rough to work with. So, I, I just like low poly. So. So, as far as I've seen, your games are always very uh, low on size and energy restrictions. Um, you know, you guys don't wastefully use accelerometer, or GPS, or anything like that. Um, and this is kind of more of a code question, but like for all the different builds for the Android and you know, the 700 different screen sizes they have and things of that nature, um, do you have any specific with the art as far as your job is concerned? Is there any considerations that you have to make for that? Um, so obviously, you know, the way you're cutting this down, that is a consideration, but is there anything else such as like um, your resolutions for your backgrounds and menu screens and buttons and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. We do, but <clears throat> it works very similar to the, how the sort of iPhone downsizing works. Um, sometimes we come in and crop. Uh, occasionally that crop is a bad crop and we actually have to deal with it. Um, I forget, I think Paper Toss actually was one of the first things we put on Droid. And it was cropping like important elements off the screen, like menu buttons and stuff. And we we're like, ah, oh, dang it! Because in that game, the menu is actually like a scene element. Um, that's it's a little clipboard. Uh, so we had to come and do stuff with that. But overall, we try and just batch do that stuff as much as we can. Because like you said, there are so many different. The Android devices are just just fractured. There's so many different. Um, so another issue. Is just the player interaction. Um, do you guys ever run into situations where on the screens with higher pixel density that you just have things too compact for the actual kind of touch interactions? Yeah. Um. That's something I think we do a really great job of is trying to keep the touch controls like specific. Like we design the controls to be best, you know, on this device. We might be testing on a computer or this or that, but like. Um, we keep the controls to a minimum, uh, you know, as few buttons as possible, as few taps as possible, because that's how people want to play on their mobile device. Army of Darkness, um, I mean, the amount of stuff you can do in that game is pretty high. I mean, you can build troops, you can, like, kind of micro ash back and forth and, like, shoot and evade and stuff. Um, you can cast spells. Uh, there's there's just a whole lot you can do, but really it's just like a left and right tap and a few buttons at the bottom. Uh, but because you're so right, like if you're 
we had some ideas of selecting individual characters, but you got like 10 of them bunched together. It's just not a mobile sort of control scheme. So we try and avoid that. Yeah. Question. So you went, you were you started working here. Was that your only experience before you came? No. My only council experience. Um, I worked at the Chicago Planetarium for a little bit. Um, that was weird. Talk about the exact opposite of mobile. Um, they were doing like mega HD, like because it's like a full dome kind of thing. So we were rendering out images that were like like gigabytes for like you know just a little short video. <laughs> it was like. Huge, huge. We had just like terabytes and terabytes of like hard drive space to maintain these, and like they were actually um, split up into like five different regions that got sewn together. So like when you're in there, because we rendered five different cameras, that's what it was. So it kind of had like a, you know, whatever parallaxy feel to it. That was weird. <laughs> it was a very interesting job, but like talk about dealing with like huge, huge render times and giant stuff. And then uh, I also did a bunch of freelance gigs. Um, I did this weird job for a while where I rendered stuff for Caterpillar, like the insides of their engines and different things like that. Just it was one of one of the freelance clients I had for a while. And uh, right before Backflip, uh, I worked for a while at a game company that did Flash games, and it was very similar to Backflip um, kind of pipeline. A lot of PNGs. Um, there's just a couple freelance artists I worked with offsite and. I was more of a lead artist than art director, but it was kind of the same thing. So how much of your time, I don't mean this to but like how often do you find yourself just faking that you know what you talk about? Like, because I feel like that's what I spend most of my time doing, like, oh, this is the way we should do it. Like, I don't have a clue. No, uh, <laughs> some of the time. Uh, no, I know what you're talking about. Um, especially working at a studio of this size, uh, we don't have like the tech that a big studio would have. So we're making our stuff up as we go a lot of the time. And with the, the way that gaming is going with mobile and social games and stuff, there's going to be jobs out there like that everywhere. And you're going to have to fake it. But you know, I mean, it's not really like faking it. It's like taking what you know and working with that. Um, this might not be the best way to make a character, but for our company, it is, and it worked extremely well. Um, someone, you know, with like, I guess, uh, a really fancy engine or something might have done it different, but yeah, <laughs> some of the time. So do you find yourself doing a lot of troubleshooting? But there is always, for like a new process like this, there's a big phase of troubleshooting. Ragdoll Blaster 3 is going to be in 3D. So there's some things that we're doing there that are troubleshooting. 3D collision stuff that we haven't dealt with before that we're going to be grinding our way through. So, yeah. Is there any way we can show them the videos? Oh, yeah, sure. Good call. <laughs> so, Again, anyone before today ever heard of Backflip Studios? Like two, three, okay, okay. Four people, maybe? Oh, awesome, awesome. That was good. Bing. <laughs> There's our CEO, Julian. It's <laughs> uh, a funny picture. Uh, this isn't the best video of the Dragon Game. Uh, <laughs> I'll show you some other ones. Has anyone seen any of these videos? The, the Ragdoll one's gotten out there a little bit. Ninja one has gotten out there a lot of it. Oh man, it's jacked up really bad. <laughs> I, I'd say we're upside down for what I consider a good studio to be and from what I've seen actually. Um, we have six artists in-house and ten programmers in-house. So it should probably be the other way, but or you know, at least even. Um, 
so we're really struggling right now. Um, we do have an additional eight freelance artists off-site, but for really tricky stuff like this, it's hard to work with an off-site artist, you know, on the technical parts. We usually use them for, like, bulk work, like model all of these buildings, then send them to us and we'll just take care of it. Um, or do a whole bunch of ads. We have tons and tons of promo art that we do. Guys ever use outsourcers? Yeah. Yeah, we have, uh, like I said, eight uh, freelance artists and probably another five freelance programmers. Um, they're local, like Boulder area to US, to we have some overseas people. So, do you use any specific like, site or location, or is it just kind of a post an ad? Post an ad and see what comes. Sometimes, you know, we get a lot of actual traffic from our website, just people looking for jobs. And um, freelancers, we sort of start, there's two reasons why someone's kind of an offsite worker. Either they're just really comfortable where they're at and they don't want to move and they just want to work offsite, or we're kind of testing them for a full time job. Um, every single person who works at Backflip has gone through a freelance process before they went full time. So, watch this video. <laughs> I don't know how loud this is going to be. This might be really loud. games have like a fancy cinematic thing that was just uh, we had some time so I personally just took some time and did that whole thing myself um, same with the ninja up one which is a little longer uh, I think maybe it's not it's about the same length a little more going on but again it was just sort of we had some time for two weeks, but it's kind of the limits we have for that. It's like, sorry, next game. No time for Cinemax. Um, sorry, last question. Um, sorry. What is your uh, like internship process like? Like, How does somebody apply to an internship? Or do you guys go through phases where you're open for them? Or? Uh, we're always looking at all times for everyone. Because, <laughs> um, like I said, we're sort of upside down with the art to programmers right now. Um, <clears throat> we do set our bar pretty high. Uh, but interns especially are sort of a tricky thing because it's hard enough working with like regular freelancers you know maybe they have like five years of industry experience but if they're off-site it's really tricky if it's an intern I really like to have the interns in-house um, a because then we can get the best work out of them by you know helping them out but B, that's why you have an internship, so you can be in there and learn from the other people. If you're off-site, it's really, you're not going to learn so much, you know. Um, the interns we have right now, are, they've grown exponentially just from being there, so it's worked out pretty well. Questions? More videos? <laughs> uh, let's watch Army of Darkness. Are you guys the only studio in Boulder? Um, there... There are a couple other studios, um, but
before this year, there was Sony Online. Uh, I forgot what they did. They did a bunch of different card games or something. Um, and then there was uh, NetDevil. Um, NetDevil did the Lego MMO. Has anyone heard of that? Yeah. Lego Universe. So they they weren't in Boulder, but they were like right next to Boulder. So we had, they both of those companies kind of got bought out slash collapsed, and we got a couple of their artists, but um, a lot of them went to California, and uh, they also dispersed into a whole bunch of different startups in Boulder. So now there's like maybe four or five more small game companies in Boulder than there used to be. Mm. Army of Darkness. Just maybe my boys can stop me from getting. Aw. The book. Stop me from getting the book. Lando, they're on When I'm on like the plane or the train and I hear this stuff going on, like that, that sound clip or even like regular music, I get so annoyed. Like it's not my game, it's somebody else's, right? How much do you guys think about like how much the sound design really affects, um, not the person playing it, but the people listening to the person playing it? <laughs> Someone asked a question about that the other day about sound design and I was like, you know, sound design is sort of, it kind of gets like the slack of like our company. I mean, we. We put a lot of effort into it, but when you consider we only have three sound guys and they're freelance, off-site, part-time, that's it. Um, we figure most people should be playing their phone with the sound off, and I'd like to think most people are. They play it at work, they play it on the train. Um, a lot of people just play it with the sound off, so we do put effort into it, but it's like, you know, half of our audience will never hear it, so. Uh. So it's not really a big priority when you design it. it. It's a priority, but uh, yeah, it's definitely not what other people will hear. Is this? Have you had like lots of Army of Darkness sounds? No, come but I watched a couple videos on it. Just want to look up who you guys were and what you did, and I got the same quotes over and over, and I was kind of like, ah, it's myself, Bruce. Right, <laughs> right. Yeah, we actually uh, we actually only had a handful of of quotes accessible to us. Um, and, you know, we sprinkle them throughout the game, but when, when you break it down, we went through the whole movie as well, um, there aren't that many more. <laughs> it's like, he's got like all these, and it's, the other thing is, you know, you're hearing him like rapid fire, like we put him in on like, every time he, per he personally kills a character, he'll say one. So like, you could go through like 30 quotes in a level, and that's gonna pretty much spend them all. <laughs> so. Yeah, uh, that was a sort of some, we got a lot of that in reviews, like, oh, could you guys get more like lines or something and keep hearing the same? Right. Uh, other questions? More video? Uh, Just we can let you guys know, too, that he's going to be doing his presentation today. Exactly. Yeah, that, that's going to be about. Um, I'll do a little sort of bit about backflip that probably is going to be redundant because you guys asked a lot of questions, but um, it's the, most of the presentation is going to be about the casual revolution, as I call it. But you know, all these companies that are sprouting up out of the woodwork and. Do you uh, feel that you'd be comfortable finance questions or like business questions regarding no, that? Yeah. Okay. Um, do you know how Backflip handles all of its ads and marketing? Yes. Um, yeah, like we are growing that sector extensively right now. We just took on a couple uh, pretty pretty high level executive people to manage some of that. Um, the ads, when we started, I just did all the ads myself. I'm not a graphic designer. I don't do very good ads at all. I'm really bad at it actually. <laughs> Um, but we just needed them, and they were so, so useful. I mean, 
we were one of the first companies to like leverage that and that put us in the position we're in now um, which is we have sort of this ad network which is our most powerful um, thing we do at Backflip uh, I want to say we get two billion impressions monthly or something with our ads I think that's monthly uh, yeah, it ranges. It's pretty big spikes there. And I haven't actually seen those numbers in a little while, but uh, I think I could answer that if I, if I knew I'd be it. I'd curious if uh, you know which is like where you put your strengths um, on an app to app advertising, like in mobile advertising, or do you focus more on web based? Oh, to app. Um, web ads are roughly break even, if that. Um, because someone who's browsing the web, there's a very small chance they're doing it on their phone. And if they are, they're probably viewing a different version of the site. And it's a lot. But our app-to-app -app stuff, um, ads that you see actually in the game, huge conversion rate. Um, especially when they see it's like another game by Backflip or that's a free game. They're like, oh, sweet, whatever. Do you guys use something like Mobi or Google Ads? Uh, I think we did a little bit of Google Ads, but we use iAds, which is Apple's ad network. We use um, AdMob. We use Bursley. But yeah, we do use. A, we don't do our own ad um, management. We have a, a third-party, several third-party systems set up to do a lot of that stuff. Bursley is what we use for most of our full-screen stuff, and then we have a whole plethora that we use for banners. Right now, promo art is killing us because the more games we get, the more promo art that we have, and that kind of just sticks around. I mean, there's a big burst of it at launch, but then it trickles in slowly and it compounds over time. So right now we're getting to the point where, you know, when we have a launch, promo art will take over the whole art department, and it's kind of a bad thing. So we need graphic designers. We need you know, people with experience building ads potentially. Um, yeah, did you have a question? Yeah. Uh, I'm just curious. I actually started school two weeks ago. Awesome. Yeah. Um, but I have a yeah, fine arts, yeah. No, nice. transition to this. Um, what do you think actually kind of would be something important to focus on when you go into game market? Well, <clears throat> some of the traditional art background would have probably a slightly more uh, step up on the concept art side. Uh, concept art is essentially traditional art. Um, shucks. Yeah, I can show a couple shots of concept art I have on here, but everything we make uh, is essentially drawn in pencil first. So mm -hmm. your, your skills will always be extremely useful. Um, in fact, that's sort of something I'd, I'd like to see more of in general, like, out there. There's people <coughs> who have a lot of technical skill, but might not necessarily have the uh, artistic training to really, uh, whoa, hello. Jeez, I had so much stuff open. Uh, yeah, this, is that an open office? No, that's wrong. How much time we got? 10.50? Oh, here's some numbers too. <laughs> this is a presentation I did yesterday. I don't know if anyone was around to see that, but uh, yeah. Here's some of our games. <laughs> the blue ones are number one hits. The green ones are top three hits, and the white ones are somewhere else. Um, so we get a lot of number one games. Uh, but concept art. So our concept art ranges from like this stuff, <laughs> which these might be whiteboard drawings, I don't even know. Because I said that sort of the range of the game depends. But uh, you know, sometimes you end up with more of a painted kind of thing. And this is all like hand-drawn stuff. So um, this guy was actually a, a children's book artist before he started with us. So translates really well. <laughs> Maybe. Um, I, I will say the 
the competition might be lower because of the sort of less prestigious positions, you know? Like a, a really good concept artist is probably going to be looking for like the high end, you know, two year projects that are like, he can paint these beautiful pictures and, you know, this is like, all right, we need 10 sketches right now before lunch. <laughs> so, and here's some Army of Darkness drawings. Heavy Swordsman. Uh, generally not. I do some really quick, dirty storyboards for like the cinematics, but they're super rough. <laughs> and it's really just for planning purposes. Um, how's your uh, like revenue stream work? Like, where do you, do you make your money off of people paying for apps or like ads for free apps? So we sort of have a, a really nice diversified revenue stream. Um, we started initially, the very first app released was not Paper Toss, it was Ragdoll Blaster 1 which was for sale, just a regular premium purchasable app. So that's one way, which we still do those. Ragdoll Blaster 2 was that, and it's actually it's now free. But <clears throat> um, And then we, and those games are usually bolstered by either ads or a light version. Um, so our second revenue is ads. Um, we actually make money off of ads from, we just run other ads for other people and uh, make a fair amount off of just that. I mean, even if our games aren't promoting themselves, just running ads it supports them completely. Um, then we have things like uh, Dragon Veil and a couple other games um, where you actually buy, Army of Darkness does this too, you actually buy in-app currency and that's super effective. <laughs> you wouldn't think that people would pay money to cheat but holy cow they do. <laughs> Um, and I don't, you know, at first I was kind of like, oh, is that really something we want to do? But then it's like, these people are buying the in-app purchases as soon as they get the app. They download it. Like Army of Darkness, we wouldn't even introduce the leveling up screen or whatever until like wave three. And like wave three, we saw all these purchases like on all everyone's phone. It was like, they just want to do it. So if they're going to do it, that's fine. We would love to have them buy our money. That's fake. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, there's the uh, in-app purchase, ads, premium sales, and then uh, there's a few other um, direct, more direct, like, uh, we'll sell these people this many impressions kind of deals and stuff like that. There's like a fourth quadrant that's kind of messy, but um, it's sort of marketing stuff. So, yeah, questions? I have a question on the somewhat moral aspect. Um, do you know if you guys have ever um, paid for downloads or paid for views or do you do any of that? No. Um, we did do uh, a promotion where it was like free app for a day. Um, yeah. No, definitely not paid for downloads. In fact, Apple c does not condone that. And in fact, if, if they find out you're doing that, they'll boot your ass. I've heard we've seen a lot of things that We definitely don't do that, um, but what we found the best way to do is just prompt the user for a review. Uh, we don't, we don't, we don't prompt them until they've been playing for a little while because, you know, you don't want to annoy them in their first five minutes of the game or something. But, you know, we figure if you're still playing after you know a day or two, we'll prompt you, and we get really good reviews from that. We don't need to buy any or anything like that. Um, although, there is uh, a lot of there's a lot of tricks and things people are using out there to get their app up the ranking sort of artificially. Again, Apple doesn't condone those, um, but it gets really complicated. It's more than simply paying for downloads, kind of. It's like offers and other games and weird systems where it's like, I mean, in theory, if we did something like that, it would be download Ninjump and we'll give you a thousand coins in Army of Darkness which I don't actually think that's bad. Um, but it would be kind of weird if it was like download some other people's game and get a thousand coins in Army of Darkness and they're just kind of like, because none of those people are going to play that game. They're just forcing it up the charts and it kind of ruins the App Store's uh, you know, credibility a little bit. So. Other questions? No, no? all questioned um, now. Do you guys, have you guys been clones at all? 
Holy cow, yeah. <laughs> actually, just since I've been here, uh, I got an email uh, that someone actually ripped the art out of Ninjump's app bundle and like was using actual direct art. I have no idea how that got through Apple, but it's in the App Store. And I think it's called Angry Ninja Birds or something. <laughs> <laughs> Which is even funnier, so I don't know what happened there. They didn't use all the art, they used the wood on the walls and then they basically picked this uh, sort of similar color scheme. We've been directly ripped off on Droid as well. Uh, and I think there was one case of uh, a paper toss ripped out of the app bundle using exact art kind of setup um, in, in China or something. I've seen a lot of bitching and rumors online about you know, like, uh, UCF had desktop dungeons directly ripped and made mobile before they could. Like, there's a lot of small games that are having that. Do you think it actually is affecting you guys enough to worry about it? Or no. I mean, we're not, we're not out to like, you know, come down on anyone for that kind of stuff. I mean, it's, yeah, well, it won't, it probably won't go anywhere. That, that's why mostly we don't really care. Well, <laughs> nothing to do with you. It's just from, from uh, you know, the, historically when, when someone like does that, it doesn't usually last and it doesn't really, unless there's some really nice innovation going on there. Um, then I wouldn't consider it a ripoff. Like uh, Office Jerk, has anyone played that? It's, uh, it's basically like Paper Toss, except instead of throwing it in a can, you're flicking it at Dwight Schrute. <laughs> it's like this 3D character that looks oddly like Dwight Schrute, and he like turns around, and you can hit him in the face with like, you know, so they are actually kicking our ass right now. Um, unlike all of the other Paper Toss clones, which are literally a clone, didn't stand a chance, these guys innovated and they actually deserve to kick our ass because it's a really good game. So their throw is a little weird, though. That doesn't, but <laughs> yeah. Do you do any uh, concept art? Two D. Yeah, I do myself. Uh, I'm. <laughs> do you have any up there? Uh, yeah. Like I said, <laughs> these guys. <laughs> I'm uh, <clears throat> really, really focused on speed when it comes to concept art. Uh, normally, I don't have a lot of time to do it, um, and when I do it, it's usually for freelancers because you can't, you have to have concept art for them. You can't just explain what's going on or like look over their shoulder while they're making it. You have to just say, here's the drawing, you know, and even if it's fast, if you have no time, it's, you got to get it done. So there are some differences between these and like my initial idea, but you know, if I didn't, if I didn't do a concept, piece, who knows what would come back. It would just be really weird. Uh, I think, I didn't do this Heavy Swordsman, but this is very similar to the one I did do. Um, and I drew this little dragon. <laughs> that dragon's amazing. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I do some concept art. I'm more of a 3D guy myself, and actually my expertise is animation. So. Yeah. Do you ever use, uh, you probably know, I found character animation toolkit, the cat kit in Max, and uh, do you ever use that for anything? I just find it fast, which is why. Character animation toolkit. Called cat, C-A-T. Huh. No, I actually never even heard of that. What version of Max do you use? 2010. 2010, so it's in there. Huh. But, uh, That's cool. Is it similar to like Biped or something, or is it? I think it's better. It's significantly better, actually. Okay, because I hate Biped. I will never, ever, ever use Biped. Okay, well then you love cat. Awesome. Okay, I will check that out. That's really cool. Do you get any of your 3D artists using Maya? Or are you yes. All yes, for our company, it doesn't matter s too much what software. Um, for something like, you know, the Army of Darkness characters, that the final product, yeah, that had to be Max, but um, this starting stage could have been Maya. Uh, Maya, the guy who does use Maya, we only have one person, and uh, you know, out of six, that's a fairly high percentage, though. Uh, he he just models stuff and exports it, and then for the more complicated things like rigging or whatever, we can just hand that off to someone else. Or um, he could render it right out of Maya too. He doesn't really render too well, so we generally hand that off to someone else too. He's a concept artist, uh, and he did all the dragons, but he also does Maya stuff really well too. 
So Dragon Bell is like the big thing for you guys. That's what you guys put on your Right now, yeah. Okay. Yep. It's Good. doing Good. really well. Yeah, it's got a uh, extremely high revenue per user number, <laughs> um, which is really cool. Like. A lot of our free games, you know, if they're ad-based, <clears throat> a user's going to have to really look at a lot of ads to, you know, be worth that particular person be worth, you know, a certain amount. But uh, if you just kind of divide how much people spend in this game for the users, it's a really good ratio. Uh, is I guess people. Uh, it's similar to. Yeah, it's it's a lot of PNGs, um, but we cut around them with a mesh, similar to the Army of Darkness characters. Uh, the dragons are rigged up exactly like the Army of Darkness characters. Um, the structures are uh, they're just they're sort of depending on what it is, a simple PNG on a mesh, or they have a couple layers. Um, like this one, dragons can go behind the trees and stuff. Um, this one, dragons can go behind the volcano. There's just a handful of layers, but it's, it's really pretty simple. And then, yeah. Oh, here's a look at a handful of our promo things. This is just a very small sampling of them. <laughs> Videos, banners, full screen. We have like a more game section. We have like little news sections in some of our games. Even some of them have like a like an integrated like part of the game that's actually an ad. This is like a some graffiti sprayed on the wall and the whole level is like graffiti ball themed. So if you actually tap that it takes you to the app store to purchase it. So kinda of on a different topic. Mm -hmm. Um is it designed or is it the art team that kinda of designates the style aesthetic? Uh definitely the art team that designates the aesthetic. Uh and mostly that's me. Um the design team comes up with a lot of the initial mechanics of the game. Like, for example, this uh, the chub or the fatty. Um, we decided we were going to have different ragdolls. Um, and design actually gets spread out quite a bit. Uh, like, I did all the design for Army of Darkness. Um, but then we did have the design team come in and help with some numbers towards the end, like, oh, you know, Ash is doing too much damage, and they would tweak some of that stuff. Um, but, like, the Chub, we sat down and brainstormed a whole bunch of different ragdoll types, and that brainstorming session was the design team plus artists plus the CEO, like, just people throwing out ideas. Um, the design team mostly does a lot of the heavy lifting in the design area, like, uh, hardcore economy balancing or, you know, like the Army of Darkness hit points versus damage kind of stuff and just playing levels and getting it right. Um, and then they'll probably make a whole bunch of levels for Ragdoll 3 and then we'll go back and make them pretty. So <laughs> that's going to be a lot of work. <laughs>